Okay, Minister Heidi, we can begin now. Great. Okay. Well, thank you, everybody, uh, for joining us, and good afternoon. Bonjour à toutes et à tous. Hello, uh, the last everyone. couple of weeks, uh, we've seen a concerning increase in the cases, uh, uh, in the growth of cases in several parts of the country, with most new cases among young people. And I know that after many months of staying apart, we all want to get back to normal. Distancing measures have been hard on everyone. And for young people and people who live alone, this has been an especially difficult time. Wanting to be with other people is normal. It's also normal to be confused with the new measures and changes that have been happening as our economies are restarting. And many people are wondering what their own risk might be if they go to a store, to a nail salon, to a party, or to a restaurant. And it's completely normal to be worried and unsure, but also excited all at once. But even though there's still so much we don't know about this virus, there are some things that we do know that can help us assess our own personal risk of getting the virus and of passing it on to our friends and loved ones. We know that this virus likes close talkers, crowded spaces, and contained areas, the three Cs. So an inside party with lots of people is a setting that poses more risk. To help you assess your risk as you decide what to do and how to do it, we've developed a tool that's available today online at www.canada.ca backslash coronavirus, our normal website, and it will be linked to our COVID-19 app later this week. Listen, it's not too late or inevitable to see these cases rise. We have the ability to choose our destiny here in Canada. It is in all of our hands. So ask yourself before you go out this weekend, is what I'm about to do worth the risk? Is it worth the risk that I might end up very sick or that someone in my circle will? Listen, Canadians, we've come so far together and we can continue to protect each other in our new normal. Whenever possible, we have to choose less contact, safer contact and smaller spaces. Your decisions about your risk affect everyone close to you too. So remember the three C's, crowded, contained, and close. And for more guidance, visit and download our risk assessment tool to help you navigate in this new normal. I understand that it's very exciting and we all wanna see each other more, but COVID-19 is still here. Let's continue to protect each other. It's in all of our hands. Thank you. Uh, Bonjour à toutes et tous. Um, Hello, today, um, this is kind of like my first media briefing after uh, a small break, which was really great to have. Um, I'd like to just first discuss the current epidemiology of COVID-19 in Canada and then revisit what this means uh, in terms of our control measures. So starting with the key numbers, there have been 112,672 cases of COVID-19 in Canada, including 8,874 deaths. 87% of people have now recovered. Labs across Canada have tested over 3,697,000 people for COVID-19 to date. And over the past week, an average of 44,000 people were tested daily, with 1% testing positive. I just want to add a new key number to our routine numbers update, the average daily case count. Thanks to Canadians' sacrifices to bring COVID-19 under control in Canada, jurisdictions across the country have been able to carefully reopen social and economic spaces. But we can't do this safely without closely monitoring for changes in COVID-19 activity. And that means we need to be laser focused on the trend in daily case counts because individual case counts can fluctuate from day to day, it helps to look at the average of the daily case counts over the most recent seven days to see where things are trending. It also makes for better comparison if we want to look back at what was happening with the trend during prior weeks of the epidemic. For example, if we look back to the peak of daily case counts in early May, the average daily case count was close to 1,800. Since then, the lowest average ca daily case count was 273, reported in early July. However, most recently, we are starting to see the daily case count trend 
upwards again with the latest seven day rolling average at 487 cases being reported daily. Although we know we can't eliminate all cases and clusters of COVID-19, we need to keep on top of things to prevent re-acceleration of growth that could quickly get out of hand. Keeping COVID-19 under control means keeping case and contact numbers as low as possible so that the public health authorities are able to manage the workload of testing and isolating cases and tracing and quarantining contacts. These functions are critical for keeping epidemic growth in check and ultimately for protecting the health system as well as the functioning of our econo economy and society. The upward trend in daily case counts is worrisome. We know that we have the means to keep COVID-19 under control, but this is by no means a sure thing. It is going to take all Canadians doing their part and working together with public health to keep the curve down. This includes younger age groups, in particular those aged 20 to 39 years who account for the highest incidence rates for COVID-19 cases across all the ages during the past two weeks. So I must urge all Canadians, particularly younger adults, to not give in to COVID-19 fatigue. This is your generation and your future that is being shaped. Younger age groups are not invincible against COVID-19. In fact, over 60% of cases reporting to the public health agency this week were, in the under, were under the age of 39, and almost one third of these younger adults were hospitalized. And it doesn't end there. Recent evidence su suggests that fewer than 1% of Canadians have been infected with a virus that causes COVID-19. The Canadian population remains highly susceptible to the virus, and if we let our guard down, the disease will work its way to our parents and grandparents and other vulnerable people who need to be protected through our actions. Now is the chance to be a lifesaver. We all need to take this disease and our responsibility to protect others seriously. We've come too far and we've sacrificed and lost too much, including, most tragically, the lives of over 8,800 Canadians. Let's not go back there. Thank you. Bonjour. Nous aimerons parler de l'épidémiologie de la COVID-19 au Canada et de ce que cela signifie like pour le contrôle de cette maladie. Nous allons commencer par vous donner les nombres clés. On a signalé 112 672 cas de COVID-19 au Canada, dont 8 874 décès et 87 des personnes infectées sont maintenant rétablies. À ce jour, les laboratoires de tout le Canada ont fait passer un test de dépistage de la COVID-19 à plus de 3 697 000 personnes. Au cours de la dernière semaine, nous avons testé en moyenne 44 000 personnes chaque jour, dont 1 ont reçu un résultat positif. Nous aimerons maintenant ajouter une nouvelle donnée clé à notre mise à jour courante, soit la moyenne du nombre de nouveaux cas quotidiens. Grâce aux sacrifices qu'ont réalisés les Canadiens pour maîtriser l'épidémie de COVID-19 au pays, les administrations d'un peu partout au pays ont été en mesure de rouvrir prudemment des espaces sociaux et économiques. Toutefois, nous ne pouvons pas poursuivre cette réouverture en toute sécurité sans suivre de près l'évolution de la COVID-19, ce qui signifie que nous devons concentrer toute notre attention sur la tendance du nombre de nouveaux cas quotidiens. Comme ce nombre peut varier d'une journée à l'autre, un examen de la moyenne du nombre de nouveaux cas quotidiens des sept derniers jours pourra être utile pour dégager des tendances. Cela permettra aussi d'améliorer les comparaisons dont on pourra se servir si l'on souhaite revenir sur l'évolution de l'épidémie au cours des semaines précédentes. Par exemple, en regardant le pic des nombres des cas quotidiens recensés au début du mois de mai, la moyenne de ce nombre s'approchait de 1800. Depuis, le nombre moyen des cas quotidiens le plus bas recensé a été 273 cas au début de juillet. Dernièrement, nous observons toutefois que ces nombres une tendance à la hausse. La dernière moyenne mobile sur 7 jours 
et tend de 487 cas par jour. Même si nous sommes bien conscients qu'il est impossible d'éliminer tous les cas et tous les foyers de la COVID-19, nous devons rester vigilants pour éviter une nouvelle accélération de la croissance qui pourrait rapidement devenir incontrôlable. Pour maîtriser la COVID-19, le nombre de cas et de contacts doit absolument être maintenu le plus bas possible pour que les, pour que les autorités de santé publique puissent gérer tout le travail qui représente les tests et dépistage et l'isolement des cas, ainsi que la recherche et la mise en quarantaine des contacts. Ces éléments sont essentiels pour maîtriser la croissance de l'épidémie et, en fin de compte, pour protéger le système de santé et le fonctionnement de notre économie et de notre société. La tendance à la hausse du nombre de cas quotidiens est inquiétante. Nous savons que nous avons les moyens de maîtriser la COVID-19, mais c'est loin d'être une garantie. Tous les Canadiens devront y mettre de siens et collaborer avec la santé publique pour maintenir la courbe à la baisse. Cela comprend notamment les Canadiens qui font partie des groupes d'âge plus jeunes, en particulier les 20 à 39 ans, puisqu'ils sont à l'origine des taux d'incidence les plus élevés pour les cas de COVID-19, tous âges confondus et deux dernières semaines. Nous devons donc insister auprès de tous les Canadiens et surtout auprès des jeunes adultes sur l'importance de ne pas céder à la fatigue de la COVID-19. C'est votre génération et votre avenir qui sont en train de se dessiner. Les Canadiens des groupes d'âge plus jeunes ne sont pas invincibles face à la COVID-19. En fait, cette semaine, plus de 60 des cas signalés à l'Agence de la santé publique du Canada concernaient des Canadiens de moins de 39 ans, et près d'un tiers de ces jeunes ont été hospitalisés. Et ce n'est pas tout. Selon des indications récentes, Moins de 1 des Canadiens auraient été infectés par le virus qui cause la COVID-19. La population canadienne reste très vulnérable au virus et si nous, sommes, nous, si nous ne sommes pas vigilants, la maladie se propagera à nos parents et à nos grands-parents et à d'autres personnes vulnérables que nous devons protéger par nos actes. Nous avons l'occasion de sauver des vies. Nous devons tous prendre au sérieux cette maladie et notre responsabilité de protéger les autres. Nous avons déjà fait trop de chemins et trop de sacrifices, et nous avons déjà trop perdu, dont plus de 8 800 vies canadiennes. Une tragédie. Pour revenir en arrière. Merci. I want to acknowledge that we are on the unceded territories of the Algonquin people. As of July 23rd, in First Nations communities in the provinces, there have been 368 confirmed cases reported, a rate of infection that's three times lower than that of the general Canadian population. And of those, 337 have recovered, a recovery rate of 92%. Sadly, six lives have been lost to COVID on reserve a case fatality rate of 1.6%, a rate that's four times lower than that of the general Canadian population. Merci. Et with that, I'm going to turn over to Alex. Thank you, Doctor, and thank you, Minister. Uh, we'll go for questions. It's just a standard one question, one follow-up, and we'll begin on the phone. Operator, over to you. Thank you. Merci. Please press star 1 at this time if you have a question. S'il vous plaît, appuyez sur étoile 1 maintenant pour poser une question. There will be a brief pause while the participants register for questions. Il y aura un court délai vous permettant de vous enregistrer dans la file d'attente pour la période de questions. Thank you for your patience. Merci de patienter. And our first question, notre prochaine question, est de Mike Blanchfield from the Canadian Press. Please go ahead. La parole est à vous. Yes, I have a question about uh, mRNA vaccine technology. Uh, it's for the minister and uh, also for our, our doctors as well, if they want to weigh in on a scientific point of view. Uh, the U.S. has funded more than $2 billion of, were paid, spent more than $2 billion funding companies who are working on this, uh, on vaccines based on this mRNA technology. There are proposals, at least one that I know of, in front of the Canadian government that have been sitting gathering dust for at least two months. 
Uh, why is the government taking so long to consider spending money for a vaccine with this new technology to at least find out if it's a viable solution to this pandemic? And that's for, that's for the minister and if the doctors want to weigh in on why they think this technology may or may not be worth funding. Well, maybe I can start. Um, is that okay with you, Minister? Oh, you Minister, might have been on, on mute. mute. As well. I'm not sure. Sorry, I think I was on mute. Uh, uh, let me let me start, and then I'll turn it over to Dr. Tam. I, I just I'd, I'd like to reject the premise of the question that we have um, applications sitting around gathering dust. In fact, I want to thank the uh, immunity task force and the vaccine task force in particular, which has been working diligently with the federal government to make sure that the technologies and the vaccine candidates that we choose to put our money on actually are the ones that are going to be uh, the most promising and the most effective. The sorry, we just. I, got, I sorry, Minister, you uh, you froze there for a second. If you can go back just a moment. Sure. <laughs> Northern Ontario, you got to love it. Um, listen, you know, we've got to be very thankful that we have such an incredible group of professionals that are on the vaccine task force providing really good advice to Canadian to the Canadian government on where we should put our money in terms of investing in promising vaccines. And I will turn to the doctors to speak a little bit more about the technology. Just to add that, I think um, from our approach and, and, and fundamentally the vaccine task force is doing uh, incredible work in examining all international candidates as well as some of the domestic candidates. As you probably have heard, there's certainly the last time I looked was over 120 kind of vaccine candidates in development and some of which, some of whom, um, some of which uh, have uh, began um, sort of at least uh, some of the starts to the clinical trials. So we've been keeping abreast of all of those, all of that data as it becomes available. And so I think that uh, we're going to um, have a very uh, varied and uh, comprehensive response, not necessarily looking at one specific candidate, but looking at all viable candidates. And the task force is helping uh, the government of Canada do that. So we're not ruling out any of these candidates. The mRNA uh, vaccine technology is a more uh, a newer, more experimental technology, but completely worthy of um, being part of um, the actual uh, analysis, which is being undertaken and will be considered as part of the investment uh, portfolio. Thank you, doctor. Follow up, Mike. Uh, just for the record, Minister, it's not a false premise because I've got the documents and government emails to prove that's not that's not the case. But my follow up is for Dr. Tam. If it is a if mRNA is viable and part of the perhaps part of the equation, do you not think it might be? How do you balance moving quickly and getting some work done, and perhaps trying to move ahead with some funding as the Americans have, versus trying to be prudent as you're trying to do? No, I think you have a very good point, and um, the approach isn't to just wait until we got, you know, absolutely every piece of data. I think the the Canadian approach is also um, to be ahead of the curve as well. So I'm sure there'll be more um, um, information to come in the in the near future on that. Um, the mRNA technology, uh, of which there are many different. Um, candidates, but uh, some of the, you know, front runner is uh, are mRNA vaccines. They are more in the sort of experimental sphere, but some of them have undergone the initial clinical trials, phase one and two studies, uh, aiming to begin to the phase three. And so the regulatory authority, Health Canada, and the experts of the vaccine task force have examined all of this data. So again, we're not discounting this. And this is a sort of accelerated approach, not just on the regulatory and clinical trial front, but also an accelerated approach on looking at investments as well. Thank you. Operator, next question, please. 
Thank you. The next question, la prochaine question est de Émilie Bergeron de l'agence QMI. Next Please go ahead. La Emily Bergeron de from Agence QMI. Hi, um, my first question is for um, Minister Aydou um, about the contact tracing app. Um, we know that there has been some delays about the launching um, uh, that was previously announced um, about the recommended app. Uh, do you have an update for us on like how is this file going on and about which provinces are ready to 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 roll it out. Uh, especially, we know that some provinces want to make make consultations before. So, what is the the information or the updates you have on your part at this point? Merci pour la question, and uh, I'm excited about the potential of, of the notification app. I think it, we should be really clear that it's not uh, not not about contact tracing exactly, but rather notifying people who have the app downloaded on their phone if they've been in close contact with someone who eventually becomes diagnosed with COVID-19. And I think it'll be an additional tool uh, that will be useful to Canadians to help them assess their, their risk and their exposure. Um, so the The app right now is in beta testing. It is being tested with a variety of users to make sure we truly understand uh, sort of the, we're putting the final touches, I guess, on the app to make sure that we understand if there are any um, challenges to user functionality, if there are uh, blind spots, I suppose, in the design of the app that makes it less uh, appealing to use. And uh, those should be concluded very shortly. I'm really looking forward to having uh, something to say about the app in the very near future. Yes, Phoebe, Emily? Uh, oui, merci. Uh, yes, thank uh, yeah, you. thanks very much for the update about that. Um, and um, I want to know on another topic um, about uh, the We Charity um, file and affair, if I may say. So um, um, it is stated in the public records uh, that the public health agency uh, paid uh, a contract to recharity. I think it's about $25,000 in October 2019. Uh, so what do you know about that contract that you can tell us today if you have the information right now? Maybe you are already asked questions. So, um, yeah, and, and if I can add also, because I don't think you commented publicly, uh, do you still... Um, Are you still uh, confident about uh, Minister Marno as a finance minister in on this file too? Okay, thanks. I think technically that counts as two questions, but they're a little bit uh, related, so I'll, I'll answer them both. Uh, in terms of the Public Health Agency of Canada's contract with uh, We Charity, uh, it precedes my time, but I understand that it was to engage We in 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 the work that they do, engaging youth around health-related issues. Um, certainly, we can get you details on that contract uh, at a later date, but uh, just suffice to say the Public Health Agency of Canada regularly works with community-based partners, not-for-profit organizations to further disseminate health uh, information to a variety of different po parts of the Canadian population. In terms of uh, my confidence in Minister Morneau, I'll just say that I have always enjoyed working with Minister Morneau. I have confidence in him as a finance minister. He has been a key uh, Uh, player. Key, he has had a key role actually in Canada's response to COVID-19. I credit him with very early actions from a fiscal perspective to support Canadians to stay at home. For example, the launch of the CERB, uh, the support that he's uh, been able to put together with colleagues around the table around uh, small business supports and ensuring that our economy has the strength to survive. Uh, what I would say is a challenge of a generation has been truly admirable. And I've worked with him prior to this of course, as a cabinet minister with my other portfolios and have always found him to be a very reasonable and a very thoughtful colleague. So he has my support, of course. Thank you. We'll now turn to the room for two questions and then go back to the phone. Over to you, Mackenzie. 
Uh, hi, Mackenzie Gray from CDV News. My first question is for Ms. Haidu. Uh, following up on the uh, previous question about we, uh, you referenced that you still have confidence in the finance minister and you've worked with him previously on these issues, but this is not the first time the finance minister has had ethical concerns raised with him. He was found guilty by the ethics commissioner previously for other transgressions. There's now an investigation into his current dealings with this. Should there not be consequences for Minister Morneau, who has repeatedly had ethical issues with his involvement in the finance file? Well, thank you for the question. Uh, uh, listen, I think consequences for infractions of uh, any kind of guideline is really at the, you know, it's the responsibility of the office holder to determine what consequences are appropriate. It wouldn't be appropriate for me to determine whether or not consequences are, are appropriate. The Office of the Ethics Commissioner will, uh, the Ethics Commissioner himself will do the work that is necessary and determine for himself what uh, next steps need to be taken. Uh my second question is for Dr. Tam and for Dr. New. Um, nice to see you back, Dr. Tam. Hope you had a nice vacation. Uh, we've obviously seen a large uptick uh, with youth across the country. Uh, you seem to be quite concerned about that in your uh, opening statements. What do youth need to do to make sure that the uptick comes forward? And specifically for you, Dr. Tam, because we've asked Dr. New about this a number of times while uh, you were off. We've seen that bars and restaurants are reopening. We're looking to see if that's going to be an issue uh, going forward here in Canada. But we've already seen in the U.S. that that was a major concern in Florida and in other states where we've seen uh, reopenings go forward. Why would we consider reopening bars and restaurants when we've seen in the U.S. when that happens, there is a direct correlation with an increase in COVID cases? Yes, so um, a lot of these decisions, of course, done at the sort of local level, uh, but it is a topic of ongoing monitoring and discussion with all the chief medical officers of health in uh, the province and territories. As we reopen society, and no matter what setting, we know that certain characteristics of settings are at higher risk. Um, so if it's sort of an indoor dining and you know, maybe um, bar setting where people are crowded and they're not observing um, the um, guidance, uh, that is a massive concern. I do believe that my colleagues are keeping a very close eye on this because what we as a public health approach is that if you can immediately clamp down and detect cases rapidly, test them and clamp down on them and be able to manage them, uh, that's one approach. But it's awfully hard for public health if the public is engaging in a lot of contacts and you have a hard time doing the contact tracing. That is going to be really tough. And they will be adjusting, as you have seen in British Columbia and other places, uh, adapting to their local um, sort of uh, approaches on what to do about bars and restaurants. But um, absolutely guarantee that they're totally focused on exactly what's happening there and see uh, how they can retool their public health guidance or compliance or other measures. Um, but um, I, I would suggest that you can also talk to some of the local uh, medical officers of health. <clears throat> Hi, Ashley Brooks. Uh, you know, for, can they, for, for the youth, I think the first part of your question, yeah, it is. Um, we, we do need to do better in how to reach a younger population. Uh, of course, the first part of the um, of, of the pandemic uh, was devastating on um, older population, seniors and vulnerable populations. But, um, you know, the younger age group needs different messaging. I think better engagement with them through different channels. Um, so some of the communication strategies, I think, needs to evolve, given the population that we're talking about and that we can reach them better. But I think the key message is um, that, you know, as we've seen, uh, this population can get infected and they can transmit amongst each other. We're watching very carefully on some of the early signals as to whether that then is leading to increased hospitalizations. And I've just mentioned some of those earlier signals in Alberta. And also, is it going to impact the most vulnerable? And that is not what we want to see. So I think for the, for the younger adults, um, please, please observe the public health measures. Because then that will assure you can, we can still go about some of the social um, and um, economic activities in a safer way. 
And I think that's the objective. And if I can, I add something. I just like to remind uh, the young people who are potentially listening or their parents who may speak to them after about a key figure in Dr. Tam's presentation, which is that a third of the people in this young age group ended up hospitalized. Uh, that's not a small number. That's a large number. And I think even though we know that the older uh, a person is, the more the higher likelihood that they'll have an extremely adverse outcome with uh, COVID-19. Uh, that number of a third of these young people being hospitalized should hopefully uh, be a good stark reminder to young people across the country that even though uh, we know that young people are dying less frequently, that there are still significant health outcomes if you are a person that, uh, that has a, a more severe experience with COVID-19. So it's really important that young people understand that they are not bulletproof as much as we might feel that way when we're in our 20s and 30s. Hi, Ashley Burke, CBC News. Minister Haidu, you have been outspoken about harassment in the workplace, especially in federally regulated ones, and have pushed for legislation to put in place harassment policies. What's your reaction to hear that Rideau Hall, which is federally regulated, um, there are claims from 16 people that there was a toxic environment there coming from the top, coming from the Governor General and our Secretary, involving belittling and humiliating employees, putting them down to the point where people are reduced to tears, and some of them have left altogether. Well, thank you very much. And you're absolutely right. As the Minister of Employment, one of my roles was, or one of my jobs was to uh, uh, create harassment and uh, workplace violence legislation, which passed, as you know, in our last mandate. And in, in historically, uh, for the very first time, protects uh, uh, political staff, uh, which would include members of Rideau Hall. These stories are, are extremely saddening. And uh, I think, obviously, that a full and investigation needs to be conducted and uh, these employees do have rights and they have legislation that protects them as a result of the work of our government and me in particular as a Minister of Employment. I want to thank all my colleagues who worked so diligently on getting that legislation through because of course it'll be a useful tool um, as that investigation unfolds but everybody has the right to work in a place that is free of harassment and violence full stop regardless of what the setting. Uh, the Privy Council's office is going to be doing this, conducting this external review, and some former employees say, look, it's not going to be legitimate unless we are interviewed. Uh, who do you want to see involved in the review? Should former employees be part of it? And as well, what other parameters should be set in terms of protecting their identity so this doesn't come back since the allegations are coming from the very top? Well, thank you. And I don't know the full extent of what the uh, Privy Council has planned for the review. I will just say that it's very important that anyone who has experienced harassment in the workplace in that setting or any other setting needs to be fully able to tell their story and to, to weigh in on their experience. Um, and I will leave it at in the hands of the Privy Council office in terms of how that's conducted. Um, you know, oftentimes it is a bit of a, it is a bit of a, a of an avalanche when you know uh, one or two people come forward. In fact, sometimes other stories are unearthed. It can be extremely frightening to come forward when you're the victim of harassment or workplace violence. Uh, as you know, uh, as many people know, uh, it, it, for victims of harassment in the workplace, uh, it is intertwined with our ability to make a living and it is a very scary thing sometimes to come forward. So sometimes when the silence is broken, other people have stories and that will be for the investigators to unpack. Thank you. We'll now return to the phones for two more questions. Operator? Certainly. The next question, la prochaine question est de Louis Blouin de Radio-Canada. Please go ahead. Question. La parole est à vous. Louis Blouin. Hi, Radio Minister uh, Louis question. Blouin here. Uh, on the WE controversy, uh, your colleague Pablo Rodriguez said publicly today that he thinks changes are needed, more safeguards around the Minister of Finance and the Prime Minister so that potential conflicts of interest are flagged more rapidly. Uh, do you share his point of view? Do you think that some changes are needed? 
I think that we, uh, listen, I'm open to any changes that make it easier for people to identify when they have a conflict. Sometimes it is challenging to understand if we have a conflict of interest. We do have an office of the, uh, office of the, uh, you know, the ethics commissioner, which uh, we can all reach out to on a regular basis to determine if there's a conflict, but sometimes they are not as easy to see as, as, as someone might, might anticipate. And so I'm always open to ideas and suggestions that would make it uh, more of a routine check, for example, for ministers as they make decisions. Um, so I, I'm, I look forward to, to hearing what those suggestions might be. The conservative leader is now asking for the PM to step down, saying this controversy is a distraction in the management of the sanitary crisis. Uh, are you worried that the prime minister and the minister of finance are too busy right now managing a political crisis instead of putting all their efforts uh, on the pandemic uh, impacts? Uh, are you worried about that? Uh, listen, I have had regular and ongoing conversations with both the finance uh, minister and the prime minister uh, and continue to do so on the issue of COVID-19 and other related health file uh, matters. Uh, you know, they are both professionals and I believe they can, uh, so as the saying goes, chew gum and, and walk at the same time. I am certain and confident that their attention is focused on uh, this particular stage of COVID-19 and the many other challenges that Canadians are facing. And quite frankly, that's where my attention is. Merci. Prochaine question. Operator. The next question, la prochaine question est de Beatrice Britness from Global News. Please go ahead. Your line is open. Hi, my first question is for uh, Minister Haidu. Uh, the government hasn't really uh, specified why the contact tracing app or the rollout of the national contact tracing app has been delayed. It was supposed to uh, begin testing or the pilot in Ontario on uh, July 2nd. So what's the reason for the delay with Canada's contact tracing app and why has it only started beta testing three weeks after it was supposed to pilot in Ontario? Uh, well, thanks for the question. Actually, I have answered that question recently, but I'll answer it again. In fact, what we wanted to make sure was that the launch of the app was as close to, I would say, and I'm scared to say the word perfect, but as close to perfect as possible so that when people downloaded the app, they would not be deterred by any kind of glitches or problems with the app in the early days. Uh, we know from uh, user science, user behavior, that when people download an app that doesn't work, they often and abandon the app and the success to this app is actually the, a, a large portion of Canadians using it and so it was worth the time and extra energy to make sure that the app that we unveiled was uh, tested and thoroughly debugged to make sure that it would be a pleasant user experience. Secondly, we worked very closely with the Office of the Privacy Commissioner to make sure we understood any concerns of the Privacy Commissioner and were fully cognizant of how best to protect Canadians' privacy. We know that is a paramount importance to Canadians. And so those pieces of work deserved the time to get it right. And that's exactly what we did. Follow up, Beatrice. Thanks. And I'm wondering if you could provide any further details on when you're tracking to, to roll out in Ontario now and nationally afterward, or if, if that's still the plan. The plan and the hope is that this will be a national app that all Canadians can use. We know that uh, Ontario is ready to go as sort of the pilot uh, province, and we hope to have that app out as soon as possible. Uh, I know that uh, we're very close now. Thank you, and we'll take one more question. Uh, Dr. New, my uh, last question is for you. Um, Yesterday, the big news out of the States was uh, Dr. Fauci. He threw the opening pitch out at the uh, Washington Nationals game, and he uh, he missed the ball getting to play quite quickly. If you threw the ball out at the Jays game, would you confirm <laughs> to Canadians that you'd be able to get it over the plate? And, and would you be open to doing something like that? Thank you for the question. Um, unfortunately, this season it's not a possibility because the Blue Jays won't be playing uh, on Canadian soil. But uh, certainly... Uh, uh, hopefully, uh, being optimistic, if the 2021 season unfolds and the Can and the Blue Jays uh, are able to have a hope opener on on Canadian soil, and they do invite me, I would certainly consider it. Uh, with respect to uh, getting the ball to home plate, uh, I can appreciate it. it's not that easy, you know, like 60 feet six inches or 20 meters uh, in in uh, sort of uh, the metric system here in Canada, uh, especially with a full stadium, can be daunting. Uh, I commend Dr. Fauci for what he did. I think it took a lot of uh, I think. Uh, courage to do that on, on national TV. And I think he probably uh, 
had a little bit, maybe too much adrenaline going, but I think he's taking it all in good stride, good humor, and I, I could hopefully maybe uh, uh, keep my adrenaline check if I do get that opportunity in the future. So thank you for the question. If I did that, it would go backwards. <laughs> Thank you. That uh, that commences our, uh, our that finishes our press conference for today. Thank you.